This is real, 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 or is this just a ride? The world is like a ride. You think it's real, think it's real, it's a ride. We can change it any time we want. It's only a choice between fear and love. The world is like a ride. You think it's real, think it's real, it's a ride. We can change it any time we want. It's only a choice between fear and love. Life goes up and down, round and round. It has thrills and chills, and it's very brightly colored. It's up and down, round and round, and it's very loud. Don't worry, don't be afraid. Be afraid. Uh, greetings, programs. You're in Red Pill Sunday School. It is January the 28th, 2018. This is UCY TV. Welcome, welcome. I, uh, I wanted to discuss today a, a, a little well I'm uh, honestly I'm just I'm a little frustrated because I I I you know we're in a battle of words we're in a, in a war of language we're in a war of attitude we're in a war of truth versus fiction and this needs to really really come to the forefront of our discourse the forefront of our thought process it needs to be everything that we focus on we must differentiate and we must realize that when we say things especially when things those things are religious in their background or in their nature we must realize that the things that we say cause us to miss the point of what we're actually trying to say what do i mean what do i mean so there's these new uh, version, this new age Christian, this new generation, millennial Christian, new, uh, whatever, whatever the heck title you want to put up. These, uh, it's this up and coming generation and they're falling into the same trap. It's the same trap. It's a reorganization of the same thing. And it's, it's very bothersome to me because I hear these kids, just like I hear their parents and their parents before them, talk about God and talk about Satan as if they're talking about characters, as if they're talking about real people, as if in their mind they can actually picture or somehow feel that they're talking about a specific individual thing or entity. And so I'll hear these people and someone will say, yeah, that's Satan. He's, he's a bastard or he's going to, he comes along and he does these things. That's Satan. Oh God, that Satan's always there. To... And I really can't quite grasp the uh, literalist notion that they actually think that there is a Satan. Like there is a conscious being as a central entity, one thing that causes all mischief or havoc or chaos right i i i i i can't quite grasp and likewise the notion that god or jesus christ will come back and save us or protect us and god will do this and god will do that but but they don't Again, you're, you're picturing some entity, and of course the church is, is responsible for this. All these religions who have externalized God from creation, who, who say that, yes, God created the entirety of the universe, but is somehow outside of the universe, sitting on some throne in some other dimension, some other place that isn't the universe, right? And yet... The very definition of God is the universe. It's just, in other words, nature. And I just, I, I, I am so frustrated by this. I can't, I, I can't seem to get the message across. I can't, I can't, you know, when you say the devil, but that devil's around every corner, will you please say that which is adversarial? is around every corner. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. But that can be anything. <laughs> the, please stop making excuses as if there is some boogeyman that is causing all the evils in your life because most of the time it's yourself. Or it's who you call your friends, your so-called friends, your so-called family, your so-called acquaintances, your so-called 
uh, employees or fellow employees, right? Whoever it is that is causing you the problems, that is your Satan. That is your adversary. Government, the biggest adversary that anybody could ever imagine, right? Stop blaming some fictional character that was not meant to to be taken literally, an anthropomorphization of adversarialness, a personification of chaos and lawlessness that is the word Satan. It is not to be meant to be taken literally, nor is Jehovah, or i.e. God, as the way the church tells you to take it. Again, you're externalizing this creator of chaos, this creator of mayhem, and he's sitting in his dark underworld throne, just pointing his pitchfork at you and causing you all these problems. And therefore you can say, well, you know, it was the devil. The devil made me do it. Oh, well, the devil, the devil it's always the devil. Well, it's an excuse because you're taking it literally and you sound like a fool. I'm sorry, how can you not believe that you're being a fool by by externalizing nature and its adversary, reality and its inverse or adverse? How can you possibly believe that there are these characters that are portraying these parts? Yes, this is how you tell a story. Yes. Of course, this is how stories and moral laws, moral rectitude has been passed on from generation to generation through the mode of the story. But I don't, you know, people didn't actually believe in these things. These were tales told to pass on knowledge. But you're taking it not as knowledge. You're not taking the, the message. You're not taking the law. You're not taking it. You're taking it as the story of a, an actual historical character, literally saying that creation happened in six days. Though day can be anything from an age to, uh, you know, it just depends on the translation. And it's not specifically talking about some constructor set that some being was using to, right? I mean, come on. Come on. Unless we escape our own literal mindset we can never understand the law we can never understand the course we're, we're we're set on and most of all we can never ever understand our own place in nature which means that in other words we are the fingers if you will we are the tools we are what causes this place to be heaven or hell. We are the dominant species in that dominion that it talks about in the Bible as caretakers, not as freaking dominatrix, but as caretakers of this place. But how can we possibly take care of this, this beautiful, beautiful thing, Jehovah as it is, nature itself, if we don't treat it as God? If we don't treat ourselves as part of God, as if we are somehow separate, again, the whole purpose, the whole purpose of religion is to separate God from nature, to separate you from nature, from God itself. That is the purpose. And you know, this even has a name. Did you? <laughs> There's even a an official word that is one of my four pillars that I'm writing about. I, I finally figured out the other word. I couldn't I couldn't put it together. What was I missing? What pillar was I missing? And you know, I figured it out. I figured out what the, what is that other fourth pillar? You got time, the time domain. Everything's in the time domain. You've got mammon, which is valuation and money, money being worthless. Useless nothingness, right? Basically nihilism uh, currency. We spend money. We spend time just like we spend money. There's no difference between those two things. We're spending our time in the form of money and we're spending our money in the form of time. It's a bizarre thing, but once you get it, you get it. And then 
over here you have dissimulation. Dissimulation being a bad simulation. Dis means bad, right? This is why, again, Dante named D-I-S. Dis is one of the names of the devil. The names of the of the of Satan was was dis. Disassociation, disapproval, dis this, dis that. It's always bad. So dissimulation is a bad simulation. And that is what personhood actually is defined as, is dissimulation. We hide behind these characters, pretend that they don't have a law uh, like uh, things in nature do. They're somehow outside of God, outside of the law. And again, the whole idea is to bring you outside of God, outside of nature, into this dissimulation. That's what the Matrix was. The Matrix was a simulacra, a copy without an original. And so what does that leave us? It leaves us with one more pillar, one more corner that supports the whole superstructure of fiction. What is that final pillar? Well, yes, I figured it out. <clears throat> it's something called dispossession or disposableness or dispossession. Now, we've said before, and, and one of the most important aspects of land ownership, right, when you actually have title to the land, you have the right of disposal. The difference between a public citizen and a private one of the state, of the territory, of the actual land, is that they hold the land and have the right of disposal. When you can dispose of something, that means you hold the property. You hold it. Not anybody else. All right? Now, that doesn't mean that the state is still not the allodial title holder, or if you will, the feudal landlord. Which grants you the perfect title. Yes, yes, this is true. The state is always going to be higher because that's where the right comes from. But as the title holder, you have the right of of, of uh, disposal. And that's a very important aspect. Even Kurt mentioned that last week. Now, what is the question becomes, what is this notion of disposable? And it turns out the whole purpose of this was to cause us to be disposable assets, just like soldiers are disposable. Pawns on the chessboard are, are disposable. Right? Dis. Bad. Pose. What does it mean to pose something? It means to question. Right? So to take away your questionability. Uh, what does this mean? Okay, here is how Webster defines this. And this is really freaky the way he puts it. Like, really freaky. He says, to direct the course of a thing. That's in Proverbs 16.1. To place in any condition... As how will you dispose of your son? Listen again. How do, what is the right to dispose? The right to dispose of your children, your son. How will you dispose of your son, he asks. To place in any condition. To direct what to do or what course to pursue, etc. To part with, to alienate. As the man is disposed of his house, etc. To part with to another, to put into another's hand or power. This is the right of disposal. And this is why they had the turf and twig ceremony where you'd, uh, gr you know, gra take, a, take a clod of dirt, clawed, again, having a special meaning, but we won't get into that, uh, to apply to a per particular purpose, to regulate, etc. So you have the right of disposal, right? So we are a disposable people. What's happened to us? We've been disposed. And I want you to understand that. I want you to understand that very, 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 very well. What does it mean to be disposable? Of course, coming from dispose. Subject to disposal, not previously engaged or employed. Free to be used or employed as occasion may require. Well, gee, that sounds like the uh, military, doesn't it? That sounds like citizens able to be called to military service. Free to be used or employed. We are subject to disposal. This is why we don't have land. This is why our land can be taken away from us at any time, because we don't have the right of disposal. That is a private or privy right of the privy people. This is not something that public citizens have the right to, and this is so important to understand. This is the big difference. And again, we are disposable people. That is everything. The, the fa and this, this is a word... That means the same thing as being dispossessed. We're put out of the possession of something. We're, we're, we're attached to it. We're mortgaged to it. A dead pledge. But we don't have the right of, of disposal. <laughs> we're dispossessed from the very nature. We're dispossessed from God. We're deprived of the possession or occupancy of something. All right? We 
our tenants, in other words. We aren't uh, landholders. We don't have the right of disposal. We are disposable commodities. But how many quotes... You, what, what's his name with his quote about how, how the military is disposable? The pawns, right? Kissinger. We're literally dispossessed from God. We are taken, plucked out of nature and put into fiction. That is what this thing is. And that is why we are a disposable people. And that is the very essence of this thing is to keep the public disposable. The foundation, the pillar. And that is so men can call themselves as gods, vicars, replacements of God. The popes, the kings, the presidents, the artificial persons, the corporations, the municipal corporations, the districts, the judges, the governors, the mayors. These are all our gods. We follow their law. We ignore the whole construct of the teaching of the Bible. Why? Because we've been trained to think that it comes from a literal character <laughs> who consciously is going to throw a lightning bolt at us if we do something wrong. That is the most immature, ridiculous thing I've ever freaking heard in my life. It is why I despised the church my whole life. I attended the church to make my mother happy. I tried different religions. I tried to... And the whole time there was the Bible. The whole time there it was right in front of me, this beautiful, beautiful book. And every once in a while I'd, I'd pick it up and I'd find something in there. I'd be like, huh, they never talk about that. Huh, look at there. There's, there's, there's a beautiful, beautiful passage there. Why, why aren't they reading that? Wait, wait, what did he just say? What, what, where is that in the Bible? What, what, why, didn't, why didn't he quote a verse? What, why is he speaking why is this preacher speaking to me about the story as if it's a history, but not giving me any references? What, what, where is that in the Bible again? Where is, where, excuse me, where, where? The most destructive thing I can think of in, in our life, in our livelihood, is the literal consideration of these stories. And that goes back to all the stories, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Babylonian creation story, all these different stories, the Greek gods, the Roman gods. The worst thing that we can do is to take these things literally. But with the Bible, no, no, no. When it comes to that, no, it has to be literal. We call everything else ridiculous. Everything else is ridiculous. All stories, everything. But when it comes to the Bible... No, nope, that has to be taken literally. Why? Why have you done that? Well, we know the answer. Why? Because that's how we've been trained. It's how our parents have been trained, entrained, indoctrinated by the doctrines that we're not supposed to follow according to the Bible. Okay. So what do we do about this? <laughs> what do we do? I'm stuck because, you know, I've, I've been researching two different paths and trying to figure out if these two paths can actually cross and, 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 and be harmonious because, you know, you look at every civilization and, and ever created any, any type of nation, any type, and they all say the same thing. It's our God given right to do this. <laughs> okay. Again, where does it say that? Where, where, tell me, where does it say that it's your God given right to create a nation and then become its king or its president or its congress. Where tell me where it says that. Where why is that God given? How is that a but every nation somehow is of God and every nation that goes to war says, oh, in the name of God, uh, bless America, God bless Britain, God bless her majesty the queen. Where does it say that? Where does it say that God blesses the majesty, her majesty the queen? Where does it say that God blesses Donald Trump? For God's sake, Donald Trump? <laughs> Where does it say this? Again, it's like listening to a preacher. Where does it say this? You constitutionalist, you patriot. Where does it say this? It doesn't. And we go to war and we say, we're doing this in the name of God. Really? You're, you're killing 
God's creation. You're destroying the earth. You're destroying the surface of the earth. You're destroying nature and everything in it. Now with biological weapons that who knows what the hell's going to happen. And that's what, that's, that's what God tells you to do. Right? Where does it say that? Where? Where's my source? Please, I, I'm source driven. I, I like to have the primary source. Can you tell me where it is it says America is, is blessed by God? Can you tell me where that is? And you know what? I, I, I can't find it. I've looked. I found that the word Amerigo actually means the serpent. So, you know, that's about the closest I've found, <laughs> which is not a good thing. You know, I, uh, as I was looking I I into this, you know, I, I, like I said, there's two paths, right? There seems to be two paths, and I'm, I'm trying to intersect those paths. I'm trying to make and justify the legal path with the natural path, and I know it can't be done. I know deep down it can't be done. And I try so hard to accept what people have done, their nationals or their citizens or their whatever. But uh, ultimately, there is no excuse. You just you can't do it. You, you can't do it. You, 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 you have to make the choice between fiction and reality. And I'm sorry, but land holdership is not a reality. Title is not a reality. These are, these are, these are fictions. And what really got me, what really hit me and knocked me down 20 levels from where I was into a complete and utter understanding was one single verse in the Bible. One single verse in the Bible answers all questions. It extinguishes all excuses. It can be taken in any context. It cannot be defeated. And I understand this now. I, I get it. Okay, I get it. Thank you to whatever power... Uh, sent this to me i you know why did i stumble across this okay thank you I, I i put it out there i pray thank you for 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 sending this to me however it came to me <laughs> i just happened to be looking through and there it was and then i you know i'm asking for guidance in my own little way if you want to call it prayer that's fine and here it is it says wherefore this is romans nine thirty two in the king james it says, wherefore, why? In other words, wherefore, why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. So when we seek things not by faith, in other words, really not, not, not by reality, <laughs> faith in the Bible which we also call belief, as I've said, when we break apart the, the word belief, it means to be in love with something. In other words, to to truly, whether you hate it or love it, you're accepting it as, as your quote-unquote reality, if you will, your, your, <laughs> your virtual reality. If you have faith in something, it, here's how it's defined in the concordances, and that's, that's all that matters, no matter what Clint says. What does it say in the concordance? It says, conviction of the truth of anything conviction of the truth of anything belief in the new testament of the conviction or belief respecting man's relationship to god and divine things generally with the included idea of trust and holy fervor born of faith and joined with it now i ask you what can be the truth if it is a work of the law what in law is truth and the answer is nothing Nothing truthful can come from the law. There is no truth in law. I cannot have conviction that I am a landholder or that I am a slave or that I am this or that I am that, that I have this status, this personality, this personhood, this dissimulation. I am not a dispossessed person, and I don't wish to dispossess anyone else and, and, and live from their suffering. I, I, I don't want to have any of this all of these that come from the law, the works of the law. And this is what it means. When your works are not of faith, but of the law. When your works are charity in the law, created by law, licensed by the law, those aren't the works of God. Those aren't the works. They're not natural. They're regulated. They're dissimilated from nature because you sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, you fell on and stumbled on that stumbling stone. Do you know how 
important this this is everything right here this answers all questions all doubts that i ever had right here because they sought it not by faith but by the works of the law now i don't want to sound like i'm preaching here again but the importance of this statement the importance of this particular verse is everything because every time you have a question well should i go down this path well it, will it be by faith or will it be by the law? Who will you be pleasing? Who will you be worshiping? Which God will you be pleasing? Right? Now remember, we're speaking metaphorically. We're speaking of of the good of, of mankind and nature. We're speaking of the good of nature, including mankind, including everything else that is, quote unquote, God. Right? All the universe. Everything has oneness. The verb being all being all that keeps us alive <laughs> all that keeps us well or are you are you doing it because of the law because it pleases the law it's not illegal it's 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 licensed or it's permitted you see the difference and no matter how i look at this the law of man in every way shape and form is a stumbling stone and that's how it was designed, a stumbling stone that, that causes us to trip up in the, in, the, in the eyes of God, if you will. Faith in fiction defeats faith in God, right? We're, we have faith. Our faith is in mammon, our, in God we trust, right on the dollar bill. How, how disgusting is that? We are, we, have, we are in faith to a false God, this thing we call the people. Well, I'm not the people and neither are you. I'm not the people. There's no such thing as a people. It's a it's a lie. It's a title. It's a flattering title. I am the people and you're not. Therefore, you don't get the benefits I do. I'm wealthy and you're not because I'm the people. I'm the people. I'm the people. I can hold land. You can't. I can dispose of you and you can't dispose of me. I can cause you to be separated from nature. I can cause you dissimulation. I can trick you into anything I want to do. I can exact from you and I can distort from you. Why? Because I'm the people and I have the government behind me. I have the law of man behind me. Now, when I speak of the law of God, that's not the same thing. We know that's not the same thing. It's the unwritten law. It's the moral law. It comes from within. The law of man comes from without. And there's a big, big difference. Our capital was Philadelphia. Philadelphia, folks. Philadelphia. You ever been to Philadelphia? Most evil place you will ever go. If you go check out all the old uh, comp commercial buildings and surrounding the famous place where the Declaration of Independence was signed. Most evil place in the world I've ever been. Straight across from the city hall is the the Masonic Hall sitting right there. Just this evil, evil freaking place. Symbology all over the place. Just incredible, incredible evil walking around. <sighs> Those who were with me that might be listening right now, you know what I'm talking about. When, <laughs> when we were there for that conference and we were walking around and we came across back, be back behind the customs building and we were taking pictures and the security guard comes out and gives us a hard time. And finally he says, man, I'm, I'm moving my family out of here. You know why? Because I, I found out since I've been here over all these years, I found out what the USA means. You want to know what USA means? And we're like, no, what does it mean? Under Satan's authority. That's what the security guard at the freaking customs building told us as we were walking by, talking about how evil the shit was, all these images of, of Greek gods and everything else. And here's this here's this black security guard talking about moving his family the hell away from there because he realized that USA means under Satan's authority. And you know what? He he wasn't joking. He wasn't looking at us as if as if that was meant to be a joke. He was serious as serious can be. And at first we thought it was a joke. But we quickly realized this was no this this guy wasn't joking with us. He was dead freaking serious. The things that guy has probably seen, I can't even imagine. But let's talk about this. What is Philadelphia? 
Do you guys have any idea where this term Philadelphia comes? Do you know what it was in the Bible? Do you have any idea the history and why these evil bastards would call this place Philadelphia? Why would you term something under the name Philadelphia? Well, let's let's discuss that, shall we? Let's start by reading a few questions from the Masonic Bible, the King James Version Masonic Bible from 1942. <laughs> Here's what it says in the first part. Was masonry practiced in the Revolutionary Army? Well, yes. Who was the first master of Alexandria Lodge Number 22, Alexandria, Virginia? Why was George Washington? What change was later made in the name of this lodge? Well, Alexandria Washington Lodge Number 22, uh, Addo Domini, 18. Oh, five. Did Washington follow the Masonic custom when he laid the cornerstone of the new Capitol building in the United States in 1793? No. It was actually laid in the southeast corner. <laughs> it's not that he didn't lay it, it's that he laid it in an untraditional corner. Name five of the ten early presidents of the United States who were Masons. Washington, Monroe, Jackson, Polk, and Buchanan. What distinguished French officer... In the Revolutionary War was a Mason. Why? Marquis de Lafayette, who was made a Mason in an army lodge at Valley Forge by Washington himself. Who presented Washington with an embroidered satin apron? That was Madame Lafayette. The apron was conveyed by the Marquis from Paris to General Washington from Mount Vernon. It is preserved by the Washington Benevolent Society at Philadelphia and the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. It is the most prized relic of masonry in the United States of America. Where was the first Masonic Hall erected in America? Why, Philadelphia. At Domini, 1734. <clears throat> you were probably wondering why I was reading all that. Well, there you go. Philadelphia was where the first Masonic Hall was erected in America. In the 1700s, J.J.C. Bode, B-O-D-E, wrote about the Masons in France, which were called the Philadelphs. That's P-H-I-L-A-D-E-L-P-H-E-S, the Philadelphs. Quote, we agreed for France... We would adopt the name Philadelphs instead of Illuminati, unquote. We, <laughs> we would adopt the name the Philadelphs instead of the Illuminati. We agreed in France. In a document titled Grand Lodge of the Philadelphs, General Statutes, dated 1861, a Commonwealth issued from E. Benoit, the president of the Grand Lodge of the Philadelphs in 1860, states the following, quote, Moreover, one must judge of a tree by its fruits. Well, can you mention within your vast Masonic empire a single lodge that has produced such results? In the space of ten years, she has initiated above 300 profanes. Those are members. She has founded lodges in Belgium, Switzerland, England, and as you well know, America. And her children, indefatigable apostles of Masonry, have raised the first Masonic temple at Bellarat. Continuing in the Masonic Bible, it says, By what name were the Masons anciently known? By what names were the Masons anciently known? Long before the building of Solomon's temple, Masons were known as the Sons of Light. Hmm. Sons of Light. How interesting. And Satan would appear as the light, <laughs> the false light. Yes, yes, it's all starting to come clear, this Philadelphia. There used to be a, a publication called Lucifer the Light Bearer. Quote, like its patron order, Freemasonry, the Order of the Eastern Star inculcates and promotes the principles of loyalty to one's country and of obedience to civil law. Its tenets enforce the fundamentals of freedom, equal rights, and liberties to all, and the extension of these privileges to the peoples of the earth. These are those who follow Lucifer the Light Bearer. Please keep in mind. It undertakes to prepare the woman, the women of this age, for the righteous performances of their enlarged civil and political privileges which have been given to them through the influence of Christianity. 
It teaches its members of every race and nationality to honor the flag of their native land. Yes, idolatry in its finest. When we go and we define what a Philadelphian is, in Webster's 1828 Dictionary, well, it's pertaining to Philadelphia, of course, or to Ptolemy Philadelphus. Oh, did you think it was talking about our Philadelphia? Oh, no, no, no. This has a much deeper history than just the Philadelphia you know of the United States, where the first Masonic Lodge was built. No, 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 no. A Philadelphian is also a noun, a name for one of the family of love. Let's break this word apart. We have Philly, Phila, and we have Delphi, Delphian, or Delphic. What is Delphian? What what happens when we take the Phila away and we just say Delphian or Delphic? Again, out of Webster's 1828, relating to Delphi. That's capitalized. And to the celebrated oracle of that place. The Delphine, the Delphine, pertaining to the dolphin, a genius of fishes, or pertaining to the dauphin of France, as the Delphine edition of the classics. Dauphin, what's a dauphin? Why, why is that? So that's where the word dol we get the word dolphin for the fish from the dauphin of France. What is a dauphin? The eldest son of the king of France and presumptive heir of the crown. Oh. It just so happens that. <laughs> <laughs> we have Dauphin County as well in Pennsylvania. <laughs> That's D-A-U-P-H-I-N. And yes, that is a reference, of course, to <laughs> the Dauphin of France. is named for him. That's uh, Louis Joseph Dauphin of France. That's where the that's what Dauphin County, Pennsylvania, is named for. The Pennsylvania Legislature, meeting in Philadelphia in 1785, to thank France for helping America win her independence from Great Britain, named the newly formed County Dauphin, northwest of Lancaster and north of York, in which Harrisburg is located. The Borough of Dauphin, so named when it was incorporated, oh, 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 incorporated, made into a corporation in 1845 is also located in Dauphin County, Pennsylvania. It is also, at least indirectly, named for him. Well, how about Adelphia? In Greek, that's Adelpho's brother. A brotherhood. Oh, you mean like masonry. Oh, a brother. So Adelphia means a brotherhood. Wow, we're starting to get down to the nitty-gritty here. A brotherhood or collection of stamens in a bundle used in composition. As in the uh, class names Mana Delphia and Dia Delphia. The Collaborative International Dictionary of English, as well as 1913 uh, Webster's edition, Adelphi. From the Greek, Adelphoi, meaning brothers. Oh, like the Masonic Brotherhood that we're just uh, uncovering here, I see. Adelphi is a district of the city of Westminster in London. We've discussed what a district is, i.e. the district of New Columbia, as we have here. <laughs> the small district includes the streets of Adelphi Terrace, Robert Street, and John Adams Street. The district is named after the Adelphi Buildings, a block of 24 unified neoclassical terrace houses occupying the land between the Strand and the River Thames in the parish of St. Martin in the Fields, which also included a headquarters building for, oh, the Society for the Encouragement of the Arts, Manufacturers, and Commerce. Now, modernly, generally known as the Royal Society of the Arts. They were built between 1768 and 72 by the Adam Brothers, John Adams, Robert Adams, James Adams, and William Adams, to whom the building's Greek-derived name refers. Well, gosh, what... what? Wow, this has deep roots, way deeper than I thought. What is the Royal Society for the Encouragement of the Arts, Manufacturers, and Commerce, now called the Royal Society of the Arts? Well, it's a London-based British organization committed to finding practical solution to today's social challenges. Isn't that sweet? Founded in 1754 as the Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacture, and Commerce, 
It was granted a royal charter in 1847 and the right to use the term royal in its name by King Edward VII in 1908. The shorter version, the Royal Society of Arts, and the related RSA acronym are used more frequently than the full name. Members, both notable past and present members, and today uh, are who are fellows elected from 80 countries worldwide, include Charles Dickens, Adam Smith, Benjamin Franklin, Karl Marx, William Hogarth, John Diefenbaker, Stephen Hawking, and Tim Berners-Lee. Adelphi Terrace, formerly occupied by numismatic specialists, A.H. Baldwin and Sons Limited, and the Royal Society of Arts, which has expanded to incorporate two of the former houses, George Bernard Shaw, the Irish playwright, Fabian the Socialist, co-founder of the London School of Economics and Political Science, was, of course, a member. What is numismatics? Why, it's the study or collection of currency. <laughs> including coins, tokens, paper money, and related objects. While numismatics are often characterized as students or collectors of coins, the discipline also includes the broader study of money and other payment media used to resolve debts and the exchange of goods, in other words, commerce. Early money used by people is referred to as odd and curious. But the use of other goods in barter exchange is excluded, even where used as a circulating currency, like cigarettes in prison, for instance. The Kyrgyz people used horses as the principal currency unit and gave small change in lambskins. Lambskins may be suitable for a numismatic study, but the horse is not. Many objects have been used for centuries, such as uh, cowrie shells, precious metals, and gems. Today, most transactions take place by a form of payment with either inherent standardized or credit value. A numismatic value may be used to refer to the value in excess of the monetary value conferred by law, which is known as the collector value. The collector value. Remember, it used to be illegal to be a grocer, for instance, one who collected items for sale, food, and other products, and then sold them in a mega superstore, a grocery store, at prices that were in excess of the monetary value conferred by law. In other words, to take so, to buy something and sell it at a higher price simply by putting, doing nothing, doing absolutely nothing except getting the product and then the reselling it used to be illegal. It used to be illegal to be a grocer. Now we have our friendly neighborhood grocers to which we pay outrageously high prices for products and it's perfectly legal. Oh, well, it's not legal. You have to have a license because it's still unlawful, You, but you can have a license which means you could break the law. <sighs> Usury. That's all it is. That's all they're saying. The mystic value may be used to refer to the value in excess of the monetary value conferred by law. That's usury. But we're going to call it collector value. <laughs> we're going to say that the value that these a-holes assigned to coins because they're 100 years old is collector value and not just absolute 100% usury, not just simple grosser behavior. Gross behavior. That's where the word comes from, folks. Gross. It's gross. It is a gross behavior to charge usury on anything. If you have a dollar freaking coin of gold, it's probably an ounce, and it's worth exactly what an ounce of gold. It's not worth any other value just because it's old. That's gross. It's participation in usury and grocery. You know, this is fascinating. Language is fascinating. The things that we fall for, the fact that we are told that we we can sh we should shop at our friendly neighborhood grocer, proves the idiocracy that we have become. Economic and historical values, studies of money's use and development are an integral part of numismatics study of money's physical embodiment. What do you think Philadelphia was, folks? I mean, I'm seriously go there, go there, tour the tour the place. You're going to see bank after holding company, insurance, all the typical things you'd expect to see in a commercial village. All decked out, all the symbols, all the crests and family noble lines or the you would be shocked if you would just let yourself understand the true history of what philadelphia actually is 
why this group of <laughs> money lovers got together, these group of slaveholders got together and created this nation. Etymology of the word, numismatic. First attested in the English 1829, the word numismatics comes from the adjective numismatic, uh, meaning of coins. It was borrowed in 1792 from French numismatique, itself a derivation from the late Latin numismatis, uh, genitive of numisma, a variant of etc., etc., meaning coin. Uh, numisma is a Latinization of the Greek, uh, numisma, uh, which means current coin, i.e. currency, uh, current coin or custom, that wraps up to currency, basically, which derives from... Again, the Greek of, I can't even say that, to hold or, but it's nomiso, uh, to hold or own as a custom or usage. This is why they call it the customs house. That's where we, we found out that the USA means under Satan's authority, under the adversary's authority. We think money is a tool of, you think money is a tool of God? No, it's a tool of freaking adversary. That's why the Bible says, avoid it. In turn, from the Greek nomos, usage or custom, ultimately from Nemo. Captain Nemo. Remember how rich he was? I dispense, divide, assign, keep, and hold. That's what Nemo. I dispense, divide, assign, keep, and hold. I am Captain Nemo. Isn't this all She's so freaking interesting? Isn't it so clever what they've done to us? What a gross population we've become. The stamen, as in the flower, stamen, uh, the stamens used uh, in the second sense or the first sense, the Latin stamen, the warp or the thread of fiber uh, to stand a thread, especially a warp thread, rarely the male organ of flowers for secreting and furnishing the pollen or fucundating dust. It consists of the anther and filament to stand. Stand is an interesting word. We, of course, have standing in court. Things stand. Uh, a contract stands. You have things standing in remainder. You have things standing here and here and thus, right? Standing is, of course, referring to something that has a place in law. I pray you all stand up, Shakespeare says, to occupy or hold a place. Uh, you see, that is what happens when we stand have standing in court as a straw man. We occupy and hold a place in society, a status. To cease from progress. You see, now we start understanding. To cease from progress is to stand. Not to proceed, to stop, to pause, to halt, to remain stationary as land in remainder. Right? This is... Uh, Again, what happens? You see, we're taken off of our course, and we're put into a essentially a standing, a stationary uh, entity within the district, within the jurisdiction of the the Philadelphs, the, the the Masons who started and continue to run this country. That's pretty. Uh, it's it's pretty interesting when you get down to you start looking at all the different angles of this, huh? To adhere to fixed principles. Fixed principles. Oh, that's the Roman law. Oh, okay. To maintain moral rectitude, to keep from the falling into error or vice. Oh, okay. That, then, is to follow the law of nature. We must labor so as to stand with godliness according to his appointment. To have or maintain a position, order, or rank. To be in a particular relation. To be in some particular state. To have essence or being as false existence, right? It goes on and on and on. It talks about, as far as law, to be or remain as it is, to continue in force and to have efficacy or validity, to abide or to appear in court, to have standing. Anyway, this it could go on and on and on with that. But, um, okay, let's go look at the word brother. Well, uh, what is it to stand as a brotherhood, such as the Masonic order that our founding fathers were mostly members of? Um, in fact, there were two, I think, that were <laughs> unaccounted as Masons. doesn't mean they weren't. It just means they weren't listed that way, and the Masonic Bible confirms that. Uh, brother. Old English from Proto-Germanic, Old Norse, etc., etc. All the languages had a similar 
uh, sounding word beginning with B, Brata, Braud, Brathir, Brati. A highly stable word across the Indo-European languages. In the few cases where other words provide the sense, it is where the cognate of brother have been applied wisely to a member of a fraternity. Or where there was need to distinguish son of the same mother and son of the same father. Now, is there a difference between those two? Because think about it. If you're a member of a fraternity, a brotherhood, uh, what are you the son of then? Uh, uh, who is it that you're worshiping as your mother and your father? Uh, the Greek Adelphos, as in Philadelphia, Philadelphia. Adelphos, probably originally an adjective with a freiter, meaning brother, and meaning a specifically brother of the womb or brother by blood. And the Spanish hermano, brother from the Latin Germanus, full brother, as a familiar term of address from one man to another. It is attested from 1912 in the U.S. slang. The specific use among blacks is recorded from 1973. What is a brotherhood in its etymological sense? The equivalent of Old English uh, fellowship or brotherhood. I'm not saying some of these words. With ending as in kindred. In the early Middle English uh, endings in maidenhead. The modern word hood, from the 15th century, originally a relationship of a brother, also friendly companionship, concrete sense of an association, a fraternity, in other words, a corporation, is from the mid-14th century, in the Middle English, a labor union in the 1880s, etc., etc., a kinship of brothers or a brothership. Gives a little poem here from Tom Layer, the National Brotherhood Week lyrics, 1965. Oh, the Protestants hate the Catholics. Oh, the Catholics hate the Protestants. And the Hindus hate the Muslims, and everybody hates the Jews. <laughs> oh, that's funny shit. Word forming element hood uh, comes from the meaning the state or condition of being. In other words, you stand as a brother, a brotherhood, a, the state of being a brother or standing as brothers, uh, condition or position, etc. bright appearance, bright and shining. You know, that's what they call, uh, the gods sometimes, the Elohim, the shining ones. And then it comes to Hade, H-A-D-E, which goes, uh, references hood. So again, we're referencing the notion of hood. Person, individual, character, individuality, condition, state, nature, sex, race, family, or tribe, a condition or a rank in the Old Norse, honor or dignity, uh, way or manner in the Gothic. So let's get back now. Now we kind of have an idea of what's going on here. What the hell is Philadelphia? Certainly not new. It's, it's, it's come a long way, hasn't it? Let's look into this. Now, now, let's be clear. These guys set up Philadelphia, set up their Masonic Lodge, and then set up the U.S. Constitution. Okay, they're standing as a brotherhood of Masons under the name The People. Under the title, We the People. Okay? When they go to court and they flash their little brotherhood signs, they don't get in trouble. That's why police, a lot of police are Masons, most chiefs, most the sheriffs are Sheriff Mack, likely a Mason. All these guys that are your so-called heroes, yeah, they're all Masons. They all are immune from their own law because they have their little brotherhood. And their brotherhood, their oath to their brotherhood and to themselves is above anything else. I was very surprised to learn Sheriff Mack was a Mormon. Masonry light. Anyway, this is the Missouri Lodge of Research. Uh, for the Masons, uh, West Cook publisher, did you know, did you know that, quote, Independence Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA, has many, many Masonic connections. It stands on land purchased by William Allen, a Grand Master of Pennsylvania. The ground was staked by Edmund Woley, a Mason. Thomas Bowd, the Brick Mason, was the first secretary of St. John's Lodge of Philadelphia and later Deputy Grand Master. Benjamin Franklin laid the cornerstone while he was Grand Master in 1734. 
With the assistance of St. John's Lodge, Brother Andrew McNair of Philadelphia rang the bell to call the populace on July 8, 1776, to hear the reading of the Declaration of Independence. The Liberty Bell cracked in 1835 when it told the death of Chief Justice John Marshall, past Grand Master of Virginia. All right, so have we answered the questions? Do we understand what Philadelphia is quite yet? Well, obviously it was a Masonic playground, the creation of, of a commercial hub uh, for the crown, obviously. No different than any of the other. We were the Virginia Company, the <clears throat> East India Company, etc. <sighs> Again, where was the first Masonic hall erected in America? Why, Philadelphia. Let's go back to the Masonic, uh, the Masonic Bible here. And I'm not saying that this is a legitimate, uh, you know, this is this is a Bible created for the Masons by the Masons again, 1942, and it's called the Holy Bible Red Letter Edition, Masonic Edition, Cyclopedic Index King James Bible, published by the John A. Herzl Company in Chicago in 1942. If that tells you anything, so. Here's here's I, I just want to read this because this this explains now when the preamble uh, on the U.S. government uh, information website it states that while the preamble has no legal standing uh, it explains the purpose of the Constitution and reflects the goals of the founders for the new government they were creating they were creating the preamble explains in just a few words what the people could expect their new government to provide them which was the defense of their liberty. Okay. We know what liberty means. Liberty means freedom, and freedom means franchise. Okay. What does it say? Preamble of the Constitution. It says, we, the people of the United States, in order, etc., etc., do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Now, when it says that, it says Constitution for the United States of America. It is for the states united called America or in America. You see, this is of America. This is not the Constitution of the United States. This is the Constitution for <laughs> the United States of America, a compact, an agreement to protect each other, protect each other's liberty, etc., franchise within the Union. All right, what is ordain? Why did they use the word ordain? Well, remember, folks, at the heart of every government is God. At the heart of every government, we see that it is, na it is done in the name of some God. To ordain is to institute or establish, to make an ordinance, to enact a constitution or law, to confer on a person, a person, the holy orders of priest or deacon. An ordination which we find with our president, a ceremony by which a bishop confers on a person the privileges and powers necessary for the execution of sacerdotal or priestly functions in the church. Well, wait a minute. Why, why are we ordaining? Why, why is this an ordination? Civil and ecclesiastical law, it's the act of conferring the orders of the church upon an individual. What, what church? What, what? What, what? What church? How is this ordained? We the people of the United States are do ordain and establish this constitution. What? Huh. There is some hidden church, some hidden religion, or should we say some hidden secret society here. Now here's what the uh, Bible, <laughs> the holy red letter edition says. It says of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 53 were master masons, so I got that wrong. It was it was three that were not accounted for. Doesn't mean they weren't, it just means they weren't accounted. George Washington, the founder of this country, was the first Grand Master of Masons of this Commonwealth, comprising the thirteen original states of this land of liberty. Oh, there you go. Founded on the principles of brotherly love, faith, hope, and charity. Well those are actually the principles of masonry. Uh, not the United States, but okay. The vital breath of which is individual liberty and an equal opportunity to all of its citizens. Well, okay, so individual liberty to, to the brotherhood and equal opportunity to its citizens. Well, that's an interesting way of putting it, isn't it? Hmm, are those the same thing? Of the 29 major generals in Washington's army, 24 were master masons. Of the 37 brigadiers, 37 were master masons. 
proving that this land of liberty was founded by master masons. Now, as then, masonry's challenge is the Holy Bible. Let me read that again, because this is the, the, the preset part of the Bible, the Masonic Bible. Now, as then, masonry's challenge is the Holy Bible. Its teachings, from the center to circumference, symbols of the everlasting. The Washington Monument is built of stone, contributed by all the nations of the earth, to honor the founder of this republic. To honor the founder of this republic. Who's the founder of this republic? Why would you build the Washington Monument, a phallic symbol of the what of Ra, I believe it is the god of the, the Egyptian god Ra, and then say it's to honor the founder of this republic. From Arlington, it looks like a giant spike which God has driven, saying, "Here I stick a claim for the home of liberty." Wasn't well, that interesting? The greatest challenge to Masonry is the Bible, and yet they say that it's their holy sacred book. Isn't that so interesting? Let's read some more. This is from the character Claims and Practical Workings of Freemasonry by Charles Finney, an ex-Mason, 1869. It says, nearly all civil officers in the country were in the hands of Freemasons, and that the press was completely under their control. I do not recollect a magistrate, or a constable, or sheriff in that county that was not at that time a Freemason. All Masons above the third or master's degree are sworn to keep inviolate the secrets of a brother, murder and treason accepted up to the seventh or royal arch degree. So in other words, hey, I'm a cop. I just killed someone, but I'm a Mason. You got to let me go. Here's my flash. I got my sign, got my gang sign, my brotherhood. Yeah, you owe me above any law. You owe me because I'm part of your brotherhood. Let me off. Okay, fine. All who have taken the degrees above this royal arch, the seventh degree, are under the most solemn oath to conceal each other's crimes without exception, unquote. Let me read that again, because this is what I want you to understand is happening in government today. You know, this has been complained about in England especially, but we, we, don't, we don't acknowledge it here for some reason. All who have taken the degrees above this royal arch, the seventh degree, are under the most solemn oath to conceal each other's crimes without exception. Oh, let's read from the University Lodge, a history of the case study accepted from the Supreme Council of the 33rd Degree Scottish Rite Masonry, Southern Jurisdiction, United States. This is from their website, scottishrite.org. The George Washington University was founded in 1821 as the Columbian College in the District of Columbia, using funds set aside by George Washington to create, quote, an institution in the nation's capital dedicated to educating and preparing future leaders. Uh Uh-huh. Can't be a leader, can you, unless you're fully inundated into the Masonic Brotherhood. Today, there are over 20,000 students from every state and 130 countries. Located just four blocks from the White House, four blocks from the White House, it is fitting that the 2009 Princeton Review ranks GW, that's George Washington University, as second in the nation for most politically active students. Well, isn't that prestigious? Oh, don't look up the word prestigious. Oh, it'll shock you. Aside from being named after America's most famous Freemason, it's notable that Freemasonry and the Scottish Rite have deep historical connections to the George Washington University. For example, Rice Hall, which houses the university's administrative office, uh, including the president's office, is named for Luther Rice, a Mason and Baptist minister, who originally conceived the idea for the university. And you want to tell me where in the Bible it says become a Mason? Where in the Bible it says you must be a part of a secret society before being a minister? You want to tell me where it is that masonry is justified in the Bible? Yeah, you sure. You know, the Masons certainly built Solomon's Temple. Sure, sure. But remember, the God's temple is not built of hands. <laughs> God's temple is within the body. It's you. You are the church. There's no buildings. These guys are responsible for these massive, massive, massive churches that you see. These unholy places, especially the Catholic ones. And of course, you've got the Mormon tabernacle, etc., etc., what we call the Vatican of the United States, or the Vatican of Utah. (laughs) 
Three of the last five of the university's presidents have been Mason, including uh, President Emeritus and Colonial Lodge member Stephen Joel Trechtenberg, 33rd degree. A gift of $1 million by the Scottish Rite in 1928 created the university's School of Government. And there have been Masonic cornerstone laying uh, ceremonies for at least five university buildings, including in 2003 for the Elliott School of International Affairs. Masonry is also responsible for the Walcott Foundation, created by the High 12 International. Well, gee, who's the High 12 International? For the undergraduate and graduate scholarships to the university. Oh, no, there's no secret government. What the fuck is the High 12 International? Albert Pike, in From His Morals and Dogma, this is pages 104 to 105. Yes, I have the book. It is verified. Mason really like all the religions, all the mysteries, hermeticism and alchemy, conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages, or the elect, and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled, to conceal the truth, which it calls light, from them, and to draw them away from it. You see, one of those tricks is that the elect oral process is what elects the president, not the people. We don't elect because we are not the elect. Truth is not, continuing with Albert Pike's quote here, truth is not for those who are unworthy or unable to receive it or would pervert it. So God himself incapacitates many men by color blindness to distinguish colors and leads the masses away from the highest truth, giving them the power to attain only so much of it as it is profitable to them to know. Every age has had a religion suited to its capacity. The teachers, even of Christianity, are in general the most ignorant of the true meaning of that which they teach. There is no book of which so little is known as the Bible. To most who read it, it is as incomprehensible as the Sohar. Hell, you probably don't even know what the Sohar is. There you go, there's Albert Pike telling you, you haven't read the Bible. How many times do I have to tell you folks, you have not read the Bible? If you have read the Bible in our common Vulgar English language, you have no idea what the hell that thing is telling you. Now, someone uh, was kind enough to send me the Hidden King of England series, or Arma Christi, Christi Unveiling the Rose, um, Francisco Manuel and Joseph Gregory Hallett. I've had a few dealings with, with Hallett, a very interesting character. I'll just leave it at that. But he says something very, very, very important. And I want you to understand, folks, this is how you are controlled. It's not that there are secrets. It's not that the truth can ever be concealed because the truth is, of course, God, nature itself. It's self-evident. You can't hide it. But what you can do is steer people away from it. You can give them fictional things. You can promise them things like money and wealth, which don't exist in nature. You can promise all kinds of fictional things to steer us away from our natural course. What is our natural course? Well, be like any other uh, thing in nature, any other creature, creature in nature. We would tend to land, we would respect it, and we would live off of it. Because that is what is natural. That is our natural course. That is why they call the Jew, for instance, uh, the Ayudios or the Yahudi in the Bible, it is why they say they're Antichrist. What does that mean? It means they're against the law of God, the natural course of man. They want to do everything they can to get you into their banking system, their money system, usury. Right? This is the only quote unquote definition you need to know about these different types of groups out there. From the secret societies we're speaking of, to the kings and queens, to the presidents, to the founding fathers, and to the Jew, which we discussed in our, our one of our shows. If you if you didn't hear, hear our show on that, you really should, because what a Jew is is completely different than what you might think, and for that matter, what most Jews probably, <laughs> who have been tricked into calling themselves Jews, probably think. You see, it's the secret. It's the symbology. And as Albert Pike said above, 
what did he say? He said, we give them symbols and they try to figure them out, but they never can. We never tell them what the symbol actually means, but we, we tell them a lie. Just like Alex Jones tells you a little bit of truth and a little bit of a lie, so you never actually reach the truth. Right? What is it? 90% truth, 10% lie? I gotta have that 10% lie, as most of those authors out there, your natural news, etc., they're all doing it. They're all doing it, folks. A secret. This is from Joseph Gregory Hallett, again, the hidden king of England. A secret is one of the privileges of power and a sign that one shares in that power. Do you know this is why, folks, that I put the rose on the cover of my book? Because what is the rose a symbol for? Rose is a symbol for the secret. When I'm giving you the rose, I'm telling you the secret. I'm revealing the secret. This is why you find the rose in so many, the symbol of the rose in so many of the decorative art <laughs> that these masons created. It's because the secrets lie within. The secrets are only uncovered when you become one of them. But remember, there is no secret. The only secret is that this is just organized crime. That's all it is. It's a brotherhood who reveals, who, who protects each other in their crimes. That's what it is. Everything else is bullshit. Oh, look, we have a staircase that leads to nowhere. And look, here's some pillars on a checkered floor. Ooh, the mystery. Ooh, it's under the road. Oh, boy. You know, that's bullshit, folks. It's all designed to keep you on a track. And I was on that track for a long time. Ooh, what does the checkered floor mean? Why is it in so many movies? Oh, look at all the Masonic symbology. and Oh, all the symbols, all the secrets. Oh, there's no fucking secrets there's no secrets they're man-made nothing man-made is of the it's temporary it's 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 not real it's not of the unchangeable god that we say jehovah is it's not part of nature it's not part of the universe it's strictly a big big fucking apple from that big big tree of knowledge of good and evil that's all it is. It's just the concepts of man. It's a way of misleading you. It's a way of giving you something to worship, even though you have no fucking idea what it is. You have no idea what these things mean. You watch The Matrix. You think, oh, I understand what that means. No, nobody does. You're not supposed to. It's not meant to be understood. It's meant to put a thorn in your, in your brain. It's meant to to justify the fact that you think everything's wrong, but you can never figure it out. It doesn't tell you what's wrong. It's a mystery. It's The Matrix movie itself is no different than any other Masonic symbol out there. It means absolutely nothing. Nothing. It means nothing because it doesn't tell you anything. It keeps you in The Matrix. It says the way to solve the world's problems is to keep everybody in The Matrix. That's not a solution. Are you kidding me? To, to come to, to peace with the AI, that's the solution, really? Okay, all right. Keep everybody in their pods, in their, in their matrixes, in the wombs that they never were birthed out of. The artificial womb, the place to hide from reality. Keep everybody in there. A secret is one of the privileges of power and a sign that one shares in that power. It is all linked to the notion of treasure. And it has its guardians. Guess what? They call us, folks. We're treasure. We're treasure found. You see, we're abandoned. We're thrown overboard by our mothers and fathers on their commercial vessels. We're thrown overboard. We're jetsam and flotsam, found by the state. Foundlings. Remember, that's what we're called. We are found treasure. Abandoned. Tricked. Taken off of our natural course and subject to their law under their secrets, their treasure. They become our guardians. It is a source of anxiety because of the inner burden it imposes upon both those who carry it and those who fear it. The secret of secrets was the art of making the philosopher's stone. Philosophers kept the secret to themselves because of its very excellence. Or society itself would be troubled and overturned. What happened? The philosophers created the philosopher's stone and then kept it a secret from everybody else. What does that mean? It means the philosopher's stone doesn't exist. 
It's fake. It's false. It's artificial. It's something that is made by man and therefore not a permanent fixture of God or nature. Right? Where do secrets come from? There's no, again, nothing is secret. Nothing that you are supposed to know. Nothing that is knowledge that man is supposed to have is ever kept secret from you. The only thing these people can do is create false secrets and keep you chasing after them so that you never uncover the truth. So that you never live, I should say, in the truth. That is the great, great mystery. That is the secret. Do you know that is why, folks, we have secretaries? We have the secretary of the state, who is the magistrate of the secrets of the state, the god. What is a god? Webster's 1828, a prince, a ruler, a magistrate, or judge, any person or thing exalted too much in estimation or deified and honored as the chief good. That's a god. What is a magistrate, a master, a major? Someone who steers, a principal director, a public civil officer invested with the executive government of some branch of it, a king. The president of the United States, it says in Webster's 1828, is the magistrate, the god. Yeah, so, okay, so we have the secretary, right? The secretary of the state, the secretary of the treasury, the secret keeper of the, <laughs> of the treasury, right? You think I'm kidding? Do you really think that I would say something like that if I hadn't looked it up? <laughs> Secret means private, you see, folks. The attorneys join the Bar Association, their private club, right? Their secret club, removed from sight to be secret. Anyway, again, uh, from, from Morals and Dogma. <laughs> and this was actually quoted in the Holy Mas Masonic Bible in 1942. Again, the same Bible I referenced earlier. All, all religions express symbolism. Since we can describe only what we see, and the true objects of religion are then seen, all language is symbolic so far as it is applied to mental and spiritual phenomena and action. All words have primarily a material sense. However, they may afterward get, for the ignorant, a spiritual nonsense. <laughs> now, doesn't that describe the literalist take of the Bible? How can you take it literally and also spiritually? It's not possible. What does he say again? All words have primarily a material sense. However, they may afterward get... For the ignorant, a spiritual nonsense. What he's trying to tell you here is that you're not taking the metaphor correctly. You're taking it literally. You're applying your own sense of story and history to everything that you read. And this is part of the secret. This is part of the mystery. Because, you know, what did, what did uh, what's his name say? He said that prose is the language of the common man, whereas verse or poetry or metaphor or allegory is, but specifically uh, the language of the gods. <sighs> Think about that, folks. We speak in prose, they speak in verse. We speak in common, they speak in legal. What is the legal language? The legal language is in all cases artificial. It is a representation of something real. You must know what the real thing is to understand the metaphor. You must know the material sense to understand the spiritual sense, But you, and, and they really can't be one without the other. can't have a metaphor unless you know the source of the metaphor. And this is what they're telling you. They're telling you this is how they keep their secrets. And they're not secrets at all. It's just that you're not speaking the same language. Oh, but language isn't important. Who cares about language? Well, here's, 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 it's telling you right here. <laughs> Why don't, don't, don't listen to me. Listen to Albert Pike. Listen to all these guys. Christianity taught the doctrine of fraternity, but repudiated that. This is back to the, sorry, back to the, the Bible and morals and dogma. Christianity taught the doctrine of fraternity, but repudiated that of political equality. 
by continually inculcating obedience to Caesar and to those lawfully in authority. Masonry was the first apostle of equality. In the monastery, there is fraternity and equality, but no liberty. Masonry added that also and claimed for man the threefold heritage, political liberty, equality, and fraternity. Now, listen to that, folks. Masonry was the first apostle of equality. Now, how many times have I told you equality is not in the Bible? How many times can we say it? Equality is not in the Bible. Who created the concept of equality? Wait a minute. What, what else does this say? It says Christianity taught the doctrine of fraternity, i.e. true brotherhood, true treating each one as one would treat one's self, etc., but repudiated that of political equality. Isn't that interesting? Well, let's, let's examine that for a minute. What does that mean, then? Okay. Huh. Well, what that means is don't respect persons. Because the only way that you and I can be equal is if we're under the same person. If I call you a, a, a woman, for instance, and every other female man out there, a woman, well, then women can have their quote-unquote equal rights. It doesn't mean they're equal. In any way, shape, or form, in nature, one can beat up the other, one can defeat the other in tennis, one can have a prettier baby than the other, one can do all kinds of things. Some can't have babies. Some, you know, there is no such thing as equality. Who created equality? Why, of course, those who seek to rule over you. What does the Bible say? And for that matter, what does the Declaration of Independence say? Remember, it says all men are created equal. Do you think that that is referring to political equality? No, of course not. Because the Bible says no no tools for equality, no flattering titles, no persons, no oaths, no, nothing that would cause this false sense of equality. No civil rights, because of course you can't have civil law above the highest law. There's no civil rights, that's ridiculous. But we have been entrained to believe that that is the law. That is the law. The law is somehow equality. Equality is complete bullshit. Now, am I racist? What? What? Racist? What the fuck does that have to do? I can't defeat Jesse, whatever his name is, in a, in a freaking track. I can't defeat most black guys on the track or in the gym. I, I'm not equal to them. Right? I mean, the, the equality is not, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. It's a lie. It's political, and political means legal. It's artificial. You see, the difference between... Political equality and natural equality is self-governance. Okay? Natural equality is self-governance. I treat you as I would treat everyone else, myself included. I would, I would ensure all of the laws apply. I would ensure that you are wealthy and that all around me are wealthy before I ever am. I would ensure that you go, uh, are fed before I am. I would ensure that I treat you just like I treat my uh, neighbor, even though I don't know you, you see, that is true equality. That is what the Bible preaches. But political equality forces you into being equal with everybody in a way to which you don't have to think. You don't have to make an effort. You don't have to follow any law specifically except the strict Roman law. You just have to be a good little goyim. You have to be a good little citizen. And therefore, political equality just seems to happen. And you're seeing this more and more. It's now it's now illegal to speak about certain racial groups. It's a, Even though, they, again, they don't exist in nature. Right? They're not. They're, they're, these things happen because of time. Because at some point, someone said, at this point in time, uh, Israeli people exist. 1940s, whatever. 1960, whatever it was. All of a sudden, we have a Jewish state. And these are the Jews. These are the Israel people, Israeli people. Okay. Oh, and it's illegal to say anything bad about them. What? These are the Canadian people. What, what, what do you mean these are the Canadian people? There was no, there was no such thing as Canada. Where did Canada come from? Oh, these are these are the American people. American? What, where did that come from? What? What? What the hell? What, who? 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 What, what? What does that mean? 
All you need to know is that a bunch of these secret keepers, these secretaries of the secret, they got together and they created these things. These are all concepts of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. America good. Palestine bad. Iraq, Iran bad. America good. Really? Really, have you ever have you ever actually looked at Iran and <laughs> done any research whatsoever into their culture? How they've not intruded or invaded any countries, whereas America has uh, done that to 190, you have bases in 192 countries? Really? Have you looked and saw who the bad guy is? These are the bad guys we're talking about. Them and their posterity. You see, they created this concept called liberty. This is not the liberty of the Bible. This is from Bouvier's 1856, so that we have an understanding of what the word meant as, as uh, said in the Constitution. That was the purpose of the Bouvier Dictionary and having it be part of the congressional record. Uh, liberty means freedom from restraint, the power of acting as one thinks fit without any restraint or control except from the laws of nature. Okay, except, big, big exception from the laws of nature. But, you see, man came along, and so it says liberty is divided. Wait a minute, how can liberty be divided? If liberty is freedom and restraint, the power of acting is one thing without any restraint or control except from the laws of nature, how can that be divided? Well, it can't. But it can be made fictional. It can be made political. It can be made, like I said, just like a rat in a cage experiences liberty in its cage, so thus do political citizens experience political liberty in our jurisdiction. Liberty is divided into civil, natural, personal, and political. Really? <laughs> really? Really, because I thought the highest law could not be trumped, but okay. Remember, our rights are inalienable, according to the Constitution. We've agreed to sell our natural rights of nature, rights of God. Okay. And the English law, by liberty, is meant a privilege. Really? A privilege? Held by grant or prescription. By which some men enjoy greater benefits than ordinary subjects. <laughs> oh, is that what the Bible teaches? By liberty is meant a privilege held by grant or prescription? Wait a minute. What happened to freedom from restraint? If I have a privilege or grant of prescription that is greater than the benefits of ordinary subjects, then I must be restraining the freedom, the liberty of others. I must be restraining those subjects. And, of course, that's the definition of district, distraint, right? Distress and seizure. That's what it means to be living in the district, to be a person of the United States, to have political liberty. Remember, the English law was transferred to and as the common law of the United States. So these people that we're talking about, they have, as private citizens of their own states, they have privileges held by grant or prescription by which some men enjoy greater benefits than ordinary subjects. What are we? We are subjects. What are they? Well, they're at liberty. <laughs> you fools. They're not subjects of the United States. They're its creators. They're its fathers. Fathers. A liberty is also a territory. <laughs> so in other words, a liberty is also a state. Because territory refers to land, and the lands were then organized, incorporated, and constituted into a state, where these people hold their private lands. Everything else is public land, as we've said. A liberty is also a territory. See, these words have dual meanings. If I give you or grant you a liberty... The only wealth, folks, the only wealth is land. So the king, i.e. God, remember, when, when we say that uh, something is granted or prescribed in prescription to you, it was granted to you by whatever God you follow. This is why you're in a jurisdiction. This is why you're in a district in distraint. This is why your children are seized from you at birth. A liberty is also a territory with some extraordinary privilege. What is an extraordinary privilege? Why, of course, to have sanctuary on your own land. 
to not have the United States of America, excuse me, to not have the United States mingling and taxing and doing all the things it does to us because we are public and on public lands. We're not in the territory. We are not granted a liberty, i.e. a territory, because we're in a district, not a territory, not land. By liberty or liberties is understood a part of a town or city as the northern liberties of the cities of Philadelphia. (laughs) Oh, Bouvier. Oh, good, good segue. So there you go. I mean, I, I what can I tell you, folks? A liberty is a part of a town or a city. Oh, no, liberty means freedom. <sighs> freedom means to be, <laughs> to have, to have enjoyment of part of a town or a city. Look it up. Freedom means liberty. Liberty means freedom. Freedom means franchise. Slaves were enfranchised or set free into the district, given the jurisdiction, given identity, given citizenship, and then set free or enfranchised into the public areas of the United States. Not the territory, not the states, but the public lands of the federal government controlled by the federal government, specifically used by public citizens. That's liberty for you. But see... You can learn from this because the first definition is the highest. Okay. How can you have freedom from restraint? How can you have the power of acting as you see fit without any restraint or any control except from the laws of nature? You see, he's telling you, as so many have, that you can either be self-governing under the laws of God the law of God, the law of nature, the laws of nature. You can either be self-governing, which means that what you see fit is according to the law of nature, not to the law of man, without any restraint or control, except from the fear of God, except from the law of God. Right? That's what he's telling you here. Except from the laws of nature. That is true liberty. True Liberty. The only truth is nature. The only truth is reality. And then he says, but we divide liberty for our own business, for our own corporation into civil, natural, personal, and political. You see, these are the artificial. Even the word natural in this case. Remember, natural in the, in the legal law, to be a natural means to be a bastard. To be a natural means to be illegitimate. This is why Shakespeare used it as such. This is why so many authors used the word natural to mean an illegitimate birth, to mean someone unregenerate, to mean a common vulgar citizen. See, when they use the term natural, it has the opposite meaning. In other words, you're married out of a, you're born, excuse me, out of legal wedlock, out of lawful wedlock. What they create for us, which is known as marriage, the marriage contract, well, that's not a contract with God, that's a contract with the state. It's, of course, illegitimate. And see, this is, this is going to be in my second book, but all marriages are illegitimate. You guys, you're, you're marrying a person to a person. In other words, a property of the government to a property of the government. You're incorporating two properties, two persons into one. You're literally making a corporation out of two statuses, two personas. So I want you to know, your marriage is a sham. It is a legal, political contract. Okay? It it is, in my first book, we we talked about the family car doctrine and the family doctrine, all that stuff, and it explains the whole thing. Okay, look up family car doctrine. It tells you that when your child or your wife drives your car, she's doing so as your agent. You are responsible as the head of the corporation, i.e. head of the family. Look up the word family. It can be anything. It does, the family can be a bunch of people living together who have no blood relation. It doesn't mean anything. You're a family because you call these men, these masons, your founding freaking fathers. The Bible says don't call any man your father. You see, you're breaking the law at every turn. This is, again, why the Bible is so prevalent, why it is out there for you to have, because if you read it, a Bible reading people cannot be enslaved. So you put that as the cornerstone of your common law. 
And then by making it secret, by causing people not to be able to read it because of the common literalist notion that we have been accustomed to because we can't understand the metaphor because religions were set up to cause us to separate God and nature from each other to separate ourselves from God that we are not a part of it of Jehovah of the universe that God is some weird thing sitting outside of the universe controlling it on puppet strings it's ridiculous even the Masons are amazed themselves. Maybe I should read that quote. Because they're so amazed that we've been so fooled. And that so much has happened because of that tomfoolery that they created. Those quote-unquote mysteries that they created. Where we take it literally and they take it in poetry, in metaphor. Yeah, let's read that. Let's go to that right now. From the Politics of Obedience, a Discourse on Voluntary Servitude, a book everybody should have. Let us therefore admit that all those things to which he is trained and accustomed seem natural to man, and that only that is truly native to him which he receive with, receives with his primitive, untrained individuality. Thus custom becomes the first reason for voluntary servitude. Again, custom becomes the first reason for voluntary servitude. It is custom to put your child into a birth certificate. It is custom to put your child into public school. It is now custom to get your child at 15 and 16 to get a learner's permit and driver's license. It is custom to enroll them in the sec secret or the service, selective service. It is custom that adulthood or legalized adultery that they confirm and ratify by continuing to use the name, get a bank account, etc. It is custom <clears throat> that we send our children to public school and to colleges of prestige, i.e. trickery, so that they continue in their public education, so that they are not set on a course that is, <clears throat> uh, as he says, primitive or untrained, right? We want to train them. See, these are customs. It is custom to get a death certificate at the end of all this, closing out the execution of the life of the contract. And it is custom to follow the will of the deceased because nothing, no blood is recognized by law, so we have to have a will. The law doesn't recognize the blood, and therefore the children uh, must go to probate to, in order to dispute whether the, st <laughs> the property of the state between them. Yeah, these are our customs, and therefore, he says, custom becomes the first reason for voluntary servitude. He continues, he says, men are like handsome racehorses who first bite the bit and later like it. And rearing under the saddle a while, soon learn to enjoy displaying their harnesses and prance proudly beneath their trappings. I'm a doctor. You shall dress me as so. I'm a lawyer. You shall dress me as a squire. You, I'm a politician. You shall dress me as sir. I'm a judge. You shall dress me as God and fall before your knees and pray upon the God of this court. Similarly, men will grow accustomed to the idea that they have always been in subjection that their fathers lived in the same way, that they will think they are obliged to suffer this evil and will persuade themselves by example and imitation of others, finally investing those who order them around with proprietary rights, meaning inherit, basically, uh, based on the idea that it has always been that way. Reminds me of the hundredth monkey syndrome, right? Where... You put a hundred monkeys in a room and put a banana up the top of the room, pretty easily accessible. The first monkey goes for the banana, but when he reaches for the banana, he gets shocked. And so he tries to tell the other monkeys, but they go and they get shocked and they start stopping each other from getting the banana. And soon the banana just becomes a symbol of, of authority. It becomes a symbol of something by custom we can't have. And by the time those first hundred monkeys are there that are gone, and a brand new set of 100 monkeys are in there, not a single one of those monkeys ever remembers being shocked. But they're warned. They continue the custom of saying, no, you can't have that banana. They have no idea whether they're going to get shocked or not, or something bad will happen, because, of course, they don't know what a shock is. But this new set of monkeys, completely separate from the first original 100 monkeys, they have no idea. They have no idea why they can't have the banana, but they live their whole lives starving, but will not touch the banana because it's custom, it's law, you see. The 
politics of obedience right there. <sighs> and we're all the monkeys. So let's uh, let's read what uh, I've probably read this before, but it really certainly helped. Someone actually, a listener, actually sent this to me, and I uh, I certainly appreciate it. He said, "Hey, this seems to jive along with what you've been saying." All right. So Bill Cooper actually read this on his show, and we found the document. It's called "The Lost Light: An Interpretation of Ancient Scriptures" by Alvin Kuhn, uh, K U H. And I'm probably saying that wrong. Lost Light, an interpretation of the ancient scriptures. This is basically the Masonic point of view or the secret society point of view. And it's basically saying what, what they did. They, they mystified it. They made it secretive. They, they made it so that the common man couldn't read it, but also made it to the point where it would be taken as a literal history or a literal story. Not a lesson to be learned, not a law therefore established because of the lesson to be followed. No, no, that's not what religion is. Religion is not law. Religion is belief. Bible is law. And so what they did is they took the law and they made it into, they turned it into something that could not be comprehended and understood because we cannot speak in their language because their language is that of metaphor. Only they understand the metaphor unless, well, like one in a million will actually uh, break through and discover uh, what the hell's going on. And to those people, uh, <laughs> well, we'll just, uh, you know, let them wallow in, the, just like I am, wallow in this obscure media platform, earning a fan a day, earning a follower a day and never getting anywhere, never, never having the uh, listenership or the power, and if I ever did, I could just be discredited by something I've done in my past, or, you know, who knows what, what, what stories they can create, and what technology they can use to discredit me now. Hell, they can just put my face on any avatar, put my vo my voice is certainly out there. I've seen the technology. To, to, we, have, used to, we used to have uh, actors read words uh, just so that we could create words from, from those that series of 100 words that they'd read after they did their lines. Right, so you get every sound a e i o u t ta tu ta t. Right, you can you can create a word out of this list of a hundred words, and that was for our protection, our safety, so that we could make sure that we didn't have to have have to pay them to come back into the studio and re say their words because we didn't get a good recording. I can make you say anything. I'm a sound fucking designer. That's what I did for a living. It might not sound. Totally natural if I did it, but with the professional machines they have now, the artificial editors that they have now, sure, why not? The, the computer algorithms, and a good editor can make anything happen. I've, I've known people who've been threatened by such things, who've been sent such things. Tell them to back off or we're going to release this. Wait a minute, I don't know that man. I didn't kill that man. I didn't have sex with that woman. That's not me. That's not my voice. I didn't say that. Well, video evidence says you did. <laughs> so Bill Cooper, he reads this this on his show, the lost uh, the lost light. I'll start at the beginning and probably uh, probably skip some of it here. He says, uh, little could the ancient mythologists and sages have foreseen that the fabulous narrations which their genius devised to cloak high truth would end by plaguing the mind of the Western world with sixteen centuries of unconscionable stultification. Remember, we're talking about the Bible and its interpretation and religion here, as opposed to the correct trans translation. They could not possibly imagine that their allegorical constructions to dramatize spiritual truth would so miscarry from their hidden intent as to cast the mental life of half the world for ages under the cloud of the most grotesque superstition known to history. Nor could they have dreamed that the gross blindness and obtuseness of later epochs Ah, there's that word. What is an epoch? A, a moment in time that begins something. A religion begins. Methodism began by the epoch of that corporation. That was the, the corporate church of the Mormons was set up as a corporation in a certain epoch of time. And thus you had Mormons all of a sudden, right? Christians all of a sudden came into existence, etc., etc. All these flattering titles. Nor could they have dreamed that the gross blindness and obtuseness of later epochs would cite these same marvelously ingenious portrayals as evidence of childish crudity on the part of their formulators taking what is literal what is metaphoric and saying oh that was history it actually happened 
Who could have suspected that a body of the most signal instrumentalities for conveying and preserving deep knowledge ever devised by man, the metaphor, the allegory, would become the means of centuries of mental enslavement by the literalist mind, the public, common, vulgar mind and language. Nothing more clearly evidences the present age's loss of fixed moorings and philosophical truth than the inconsistency of its attitudes towards the sacred scriptures of antiquity. Remember, a scripture is, is, it is not just the Bible. Scripture can be any book that uh, expresses law, knowledge, etc. The general mind indoctrinated by priestcraft regards them as infallible revelations and holds them as fetishes, which it were a sacrilege to challenge, while theological scholarship hedges from pious veneration of them over to outright skepticism of their divine origin, swinging more recently to a view which takes them to the simple conceptions of men just emerging from cave and forest barbarism. Now, this is a reference to both the fundamentalist, literalist Christian, who is a member of a religion, and he who is the opposite of that, who says the Bible is childish, that God is a childish concept, etc., etc. We are both the victims. This is essentially... What I'm reading right now is essentially an admission of guilt. It is an admission that they went in and created this body of knowledge in metaphor, in allegory, as it's meant to be taken in their little societies, how to self-govern and how to rule those who cannot self-govern themselves. And they put it into metaphor. In other words, they put it into the language of the gods, which is verse. And we take it as prose or literalism and history instead of getting the message, getting the deeper knowledge. This is an admission of guilt. They, secret societies, went in, did their magic, did their word magic, did their thing. And he's literally telling you that for 16 centuries, a bunch of idiots have taken it. No offense. I mean, we're all idiots. We've all been raised the same way. I was an idiot too, but I overcame. And that's what I expect all of you to do is overcome. Just I'm not, I'm not telling you that you're bad or good. I'm just saying, hey, overcome it. Overcome the disease that these secret societies have made their mysteries, have, have made you believe that they are something special when they're not, that they are something at all when they are not. So he says, you got the priest class and the followers who, who is it's sacrilege to, to go against the word, right? Because even the word word is mistranslated. <laughs> the word of God means the law or son of God, right? They're the same thing. It's sacrilege to go against it, because, and it has to be read the way it's written, even though there's 30 different translations and versions, and it's none of them have to do with anything in the older verse. Right? It's just, it's just ridiculous. So, and then you have the, the opposite of that, who literally think it's, it's uh, this was written so long ago that these people were complete, you know, uneducated, not had no technology, had no this, had no this, and therefore they couldn't have knowledge. Both absolutely 100% incorrect. The character of divine dictation and absolute wisdom assigned to them on the one thesis has yielded to that of the ignorant speculation of primitive folk on the other. Was it a scholar who wrote it, or was it a caveman who, who chiseled out some symbols on a stone? that there is a possible truer characterization of them lying midway between the extravagances of these two extreme views has not seemed to come through to intelligence at any time. It has not occurred to students of religion that ancient scripts are the work neither of supreme deity on the one side nor of groping infantile humanity on the other, but that their production must be sought in a region intermediate between the two. They came neither from supernal deity nor from common humanity, but from humanity divinized. They were the output of the normal humans graduated to divine or near divine status, i.e. St. Paul's just men made perfect. Their divinity is therefore not transcendent and exotic, and their humanity is not crude and doltish. They bear the marks, therefore, of human sagacity. Exalted to divine mastership. What are we talking about? Masons. Freemasonry, the secret societies. You see, this is how they view themselves. They're not quite gods, but as close as you can possibly be to being godlike, and uh, therefore much, much higher than the basic crude people like you and me. 
and yet what bothers me about that is that they do want to keep this secret because they know the only way they can control the other people who have not had the privilege of having such sagacity, of having such education, of having the, the deciphering tools to cut through this nonsense that they created. The only way they can control people is if they, they don't give them the deciphering tools, they, that they keep it secret. So that only the knowledge that's expressed, the truth that is expressed, is taken as literal history and literal, uh, you know, there really was a sea monster who swallowed Jonah. There really was this. There really was a great flood. There really was, right? <laughs> no, no, it's metaphor. And that's how the, that's how the, that's how they speak again. <laughs> Manly P. Hall, what did he say? He said, prose is the common language and verse or poetry, metaphor, allegory is the language of the gods. What are they, well, they're calling themselves gods. They're calling themselves divin, divine, not crude and doltish like us. We have here the ground for the only sane acceptance of the ancient scriptures as books of accredited wisdom. I agree. We are, it's not written by God, quote unquote, and it's not written by cavemen. We are, we are neither asked to believe them inscribed by the finger of omnipotent deity, nor forced to attribute them to the undeveloped brains of primitives. They can be seen as the products of sage wisdom, garnered by generations of men who had finally risen to clear understanding. Does that mean they were good men? No. They, <laughs> they wanted to keep the secret. <laughs> They're the bad guys in the book of Eli. They are the literary heritage bequeathed by men grown to the statute of divinity. Their veneration by the world for long centuries, even carried to the extreme of outrageous psychophancy, attests an indestructible tradition of their organization from sources accredited as divine and infallible. You want to know why they do their elaborate ceremonies? <laughs> why they have their divine books? Yeah, well, now you understand. They must make themselves appear to be divine. And, of course, the infallibility that's attributed to the king and the pope. Their successful hold on the popular mind of many ages bespeaks also the unshakable foundations of their wisdom. They have withstood consistently the test of generations of human experience. Their wisdom holds against life, it reigns true, and it is all the more precious to us because of its authorship by men of our own evolution, since thereby it does not miss immediate pertinence to our life. Both the conventional views of Bible authorship have militated against the possible high service of the scriptures to mankind. The theory of their divine dictation to holy men of old has led to the abject surrender of the rational mind before their impregnable fortress of direct assertion, its hypnotization by a fetish, and the crippling of its native energies. The theory of their production by early crudity tends to the disparagement of the value and validity of their message. The other view here advanced preserves their venerative authority while it brings their authorship from alleged cosmic divinity back to men of earth. It preserves mental integrity by enabling us to assign scriptural authorship to human agency, where it alone is acceptable. It is understandable that evolved men with vision to open to knowledge of the laws of life would indict sage tomes for the enlightenment of those less advanced. In any case... The Bibles are here. The Bibles are here. The scriptures, multiple, are here. Many of them, I'm sure, that we don't even know exist in the common field. They must be accounted for. The phenomenon of their existence among the nations, their hoary age, their escape from destruction through the centuries, the eradicable tradition of their divine origin and authority, their almost universal veneration, must all find some factual ground of explanation. The theory offered in refutation of the two conventional ones seems the only one that provides such a rational and acceptable basis. And since the belief in their sacredness generally persists, it cannot be regarded as less than momentous that the world should know of a surety that while these revealed relics are not the voice of the personified cosmos, <laughs> personified cosmos, 
personified cosmos, what have I been telling you? <laughs> what do they want you to believe? They want you to believe that the Bible is written by the voice of the personified cosmos. Right? God personified, nature personified as a man in the clouds, separate from nature. While these revealed relics are not the voice of the personified cosmos, neither are they the mere speculative romancing of cavemen or scholastics. They are the sure word of perfected wisdom. This is what I keep trying to tell you. They're self-evident, in other words. They're self-evident truths. And though they're told in what I consider at this point to be the only real way of expressing anything, which is through metaphor and through allegory, through story form. History is full of facts. Facts are never true. Facts cannot be uh, felt. Facts cannot be understood in the way that this type of wisdom can through allegory, through verse. They are the sure word of perfected wisdom. There was a time in early human history when enlightened men possessed true knowledge, the passport to wisdom. Clear and concise answers to the profoundest problems of philosophy were known. See, that's, that's defeating your, your concept that because of technology, because of the internet, that you're smarter than past generations. You're so much fucking dumber. We are so much dumber that we're going through an awakening. You have to be dumbed down to go through an awakening. So if you're going to acknowledge the awakening, the spiritual awakening, you have to realize you're at the bottom of the spectrum of, of, of knowledge. And this is what he's trying to tell you. Hey, it's time to it's time to take this for what it is. And so far as the human intellectual faculty is capable of it, an understanding of the mystery and riddle of life itself and the laws of its evolutionary unfolding was achieved by men who, as Hermes said, had been reborn in mind. This is what we need to do. Folks, we need to help each other in the rebirth of our mind. We must be reborn back into nature. That's the true meaning. Reborn back into the laws of nature as put forward in the metaphor and allegory of the Bible. In the story of Jesus Christ, who is the personification of law. God as portrayed the personification of the cosmos, the universe, Jesus Christ, the personification of the law of God as a man who follows it. Thus we all become sons of God as the Bible instructs. A son is one who follows the father. But your fathers are George Washington and now Donald fucking Trump. For 16 centuries, the best intelligence of the West took the ancient sages' books of wisdom which were in all cases the spiritual dramatizations of the experience of the human soul on earth for objective historical narratives. Sixteen centuries of literalism. The spectacle that will soon throw the world first into wonder, confusion, and dismay, and then into clownish laughter is that of a civilization covering one-third of the globe and boasting itself as the highest in culture in the historical period, all the while taking its moral and spiritual guidance for an eon from a book or books of the true content and meaning of which it never for one moment has had the slightest inkling. Now, if you didn't understand that last sentence, that last paragraph, that's talking about all of you. That's talking about me. That's talking about my parents and their parents before them for 16 God literally damned centuries. Literally damned from God. Centuries. We've been kept from God. We've been kept in a literalist mindset, a public education. Most of us completely illiterate from any language, let alone the English one. Then we were taught the English language, the dog Latin, the grammatical set uh, of Latin meant to deceive, and we were made into beasts. And now we're accepting the mark of a beast, the mark of the beast, which is coming from the United Nations and the World Bank and everything else. Biometric identity and the worship of the AI as our new artificial out-of-control god. Harry Brown leaves us with this final warning. He says, It is well known that in war the first casualty is truth, 
uh, during any war, truth is forsaken for propaganda, and that is exactly where we find ourselves today. We are in a spiritual battle between those with the eyes to see and ears to hear, those who can read the Bible, those who are willing to learn the language, those, those one in a million, perhaps, maybe one in a thousand, who are willing to do everything they can to try to save everyone else, help everyone else, to bring everyone else the word, and be laughed and stoned and ridiculed because of it. <clears throat> Welcome to my world. Welcome to UCY.TV. This has been Red Pill Sunday School. And we'll see you next week.